2, verses 1 through to 17. Let us hear the word of God. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph. And they found the babe lying in a manger And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. So reads God's word to us. Let us hear the word of God once more. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet. And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah, for from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way. And behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother. And they fell down and worshipped him. Then opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, 
gold and frankincense and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So reads God's word. Now before Vinnie comes and speaks to us, uh, we're going to sing another carol. Well, a very good evening to everybody. It's nice to be in Liverpool. I was hearing about a, a man, and he was a forgetful professor. And he was moving house. So his wife said to him, George, when you come back from work tonight, do not come to this address. We will have moved. So go to the new one. Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, okay. Well, five o'clock, there's a fellow walking up the drive, wondering where all everybody is. And he turned to a young lad who was there, and he said, hey, young man, he said, do you know where the family are who used to live in this house? And the lad said, Dad, my mum told me that you get it all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't want you to forget this evening this great um, message from God's word. It's his word. And we're simply going to look at lessons from the birth of Jesus. And it's Billy Graham who once said, there comes a time when another voice takes over. So let's just ask heaven to speak through God's word. Heavenly Father, I would like you to speak to me. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're looking at the greatest person who's ever lived. It says here, Luke 2. And it came to pass in those days that the decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census took place when Quirinius was governing Syria. So all went to be registered, everyone to his own city, and Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. He was of the house and the lineage of David. The first lesson that we get from this passage, ladies and gentlemen, is this man, Joseph, was engaged to Mary. And then the big circumstance was there was going to be a count up. Now, why would the Romans want to count up? Well, of course, they had to collect the taxes and pay for the facilities, and they would be a very forward thinking outfit. And so we needed to know well, one reason how much money we had and what we could afford. And in the circumstance that they found themselves, what was interesting was this was to be the fulfillment of a prophecy thousands of years earlier. Because Michael had said the Messiah would come out of Bethlehem. I checked today how far Bethlehem's journey was for them. And the answer is 91 miles. So when that decree was sent, go to the place where of your birth to be counted up, they had to travel 91 miles. And in doing so, they didn't probably know it, or maybe they did. They were fulfilling this great prophecy of Micah thousands of years earlier, that out of Bethlehem, 91 miles away, would come the child. When you work through the prophecies on the life of Jesus, there's well over 250 messianic ones. Some of them are staggering. A man said to me once in the open air, well, all Jesus did was read them and, you know, fit in. Oh, really? At the cross, they'll gamble for my garments. They'll take me down and put me in an empty tomb. bit difficult to read that and sort it out, isn't it? And do you see what I mean? There's all these great prophecies of the Old Testament saying, to the detail, this Messiah would come. What I find staggering, and the atheists never able to understand this, and never able to get it right, you say to them, listen, 
One of the prophecies is that he must be sold for 30 pieces of silver. I suppose in soccer terms he was going to go in the December window. Who decided the amount? Answer, Judas and his enemies. If it would have been 29, he could not have been the Messiah. If it had been 31, he would not have been the Messiah. It had to be spot on thousands of years earlier, agreed by God, 30 pieces of silver. And when you take them apart, folks, there's a great, great wealth of knowledge and truth there and richness to give you great confidence in God's word. So the first lesson is that they had to go a 91-mile journey. But even though that was a tough journey, it was in the will of God. I do not know your circumstance. But sometimes, where you are, when it's tough, is where God wants you. Don't always think when it's easy, that's the place. One wit said, you know, be careful of the grass, is all this greener on the other side. It could well be AstroTurf. <laughs> you see, folks, here we have it. This young couple have got to go on an arduous journey with a, a girl or a lady who's pregnant, no protection in many ways, getting there, nobody to help them, and yet they got up and went. And while they were in Bethlehem, the Messiah was born. That is fantastic timing. In other words, there was a bigger story going on. I'm always fascinated by well, things that happen in the world, I like to try and work out why was it a success or why was it a flop? Do you remember 1976? I remember coming home from school and I looked at the TV and I thought, what's that aeroplane doing on that landing strip? It was called the Siege of Entebbe. Some of you older ones will know what happened. A plane flying from Tel Aviv was hijacked by Palestinian terrorists it was flying to Netherlands. It was taken to Entebbe Airport in Africa, and Idi Amin gave the terrorists 100 Ugandan soldiers to help them. On board, there was over 200 people. Some were Gentiles, 96 were Jews. So they split them into two groups, and they put all the Jews in a certain room. They kept them because they were using them to trade off to get their prisoners from Palestine off the Israelis. You've heard all this before, haven't you? When they came to pull off their plan, it's an incredible story. The Israelis had to fly the jets with no lights on at night, well, down south, from the Middle East, down south, to Africa, and they did it. They landed on the airstrip, they passed all their enemies, and they had to fly low enough so they wouldn't be on the radar. And do you know how they got most of them out? There was only one or two killed. They had a plan, and they were gonna burst into the doors of the room where the Jewish um, people were. And they were gonna shout in Hebrew, hit the floor. And if you knew the Hebrew language, you'd hit the floor. And then they were going to spray all bullets at chest height right across the room. That's how they got them out. But when they found there was a problem, and the news came that the, their people were stuck in Entebbe Airport, do you know what they found? The architects had an influence from Jerusalem to build the building. So it was easy for them to get the plans to know where everybody was. There was a bigger thing going on. And when that baby was born, Micah had said it in the Old Testament, there's a bigger thing going on. That's lesson number one. Then lesson number two, they all went to be registered. Jesus also, uh, Joseph also went to Galilee, out the city of Nazareth. 
And in verse 6, it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn, so wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now that little phrase, there is no room for them in the inn, could be an epitaph for Jesus' life. There was no room at the inn. There was no room amongst his people. He came to his own. His own did not receive him, John 1. There was no room for him in Jerusalem, the place of worship. He had to make a whip and turn out the money changers. And there was no room in the Gentile hearts. And there's no room today for Jesus. Is there room in your life? And that's like a little, as I say, an epitaph. If you are to live for Jesus Christ, get this big rule, especially young people, you will not fit in. Heaven does never feel comfortable on earth. Now, don't get me wrong. We don't want oddballs. A lot of them don't fit in. We've got enough oddballs, haven't we? Christian oddballs from time to time. They turn up, don't they? But when I say we won't fit in, you'll feel that you don't belong. In about two weeks, you'll sit opposite probably your nearest and dearest. You'll be in the same living room. They'll be in one world. You'll be in another because they've got one nature, one birth, and you've got two. And Jesus' life was one whereby people were attracted to him because he was attractively different. The common people would hear him gladly. Isn't that great? People want him to go. We want to hear this man. I mean, how many people can say that the politicians these days? Well, who do we trust now? Well, who do we trust? Who can we say is telling the truth? But Christ is like a magnet. He's teaching. But generally speaking in society, he was an outcast. My kingdom is not of this world. So there's no room. Now, notice what happens next. So the baby is born, he's wrapped in swaddling clothes, he's laid in a manger. Now there were the same, in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And then it says, the angel of the Lord appeared to them. Them guys must have been rocketed to the core, mustn't they? I mean, I remember I was asked to go and speak in Newcastle. And I said to my friend Dave, because I was busy all weekend, oh Dave, will you drive me up? Late Saturday night, so about 11 o'clock, we left Merseyside, heading for Newcastle. I'd never been to Newcastle before. It is a beautiful city, I do like it. And, but I woke up, just as you were driving along, at about three in the morning, and looked out the window to see the Angel of the North. And I'd never seen it. It is huge, it's massive. And I thought, whoa, what's that? But these shepherds, wow, an angel of heaven appearing. Just one of them. And isn't it interesting that God announced it to the shepherds? Because when we go to Matthew's gospel, the society success group in the palace, they haven't the foggiest where the baby is to be born. Herod and all his cronies did not know where he was to be born. So Jesus is born and the angels are sent to the poor people. These were people, when we have shepherds today, you know, shepherds, they do the job, probably go home. These are people who lived in the fields with the sheep. You see, in the West, we seem to value people because they're they can earn a lot of money. And um, do you know how much Mr. Musk is worth? Are you ready? And he's the second richest, not even the top. 189.1 billion pounds. 
That's a lot of dosh, isn't it? And he's the second highest in the world. That's 189 million pounds. But God came to these poor people. And you know why? Because when he looks on a life, he doesn't judge a life as acceptable because it's rich and famous. You see, when Jesus was on the cross, he didn't pay any more pain for Cliff Richard than for Joe Bloggs. To get Cliff saved and get Joe Bloggs saved, it wouldn't cost God any less. Because all men in God's eyes are equal, aren't they? And I heard about a teacher, quite a sharp teacher, and she had a beautiful, pristine 20-pound note. She said to a junior school class, hands up, who wants this? And there were 35 hands rocketed up. And then she pulled out the little bag, a disheveled 20-pound note. It was filthy. She deliberately tramped on it and put it in the mud before the lesson. And who wants this? And the same number of hands went up because they knew the value of the 20 pound note, dirty or clean. And folks, God knows the value of a rich person or a poor people. They're all the same. And heaven went for the poor. Never forget the poor. You will have them with you always, said Jesus. And then notice what they said to these shepherds. Do not be afraid, I bring you good news. Now if you'd have turned your telly on at six o'clock tonight, you'd have got the six o'clock bad news. Don't wish to depress you, but if you go home and turn it on at ten, you'll get the ten o'clock bad news. Because what we need is good news. And folks, for good news to be good news, it must sound like good news. You know, somebody, I was in the shop the other day and the fellow was buying a lottery ticket and I thought, I haven't won the lottery for 40 years. I wonder why. <laughs> you probably can work out why. <laughs> but if I did win the lottery, I wouldn't go, oh no, I won the lottery. <laughs> There'd be a something in my voice with a cry of joy, wouldn't there? I'm not recommending the lottery unless you choose the hymn numbers. You might win the Christian lottery, I don't know. That'd be an interesting one. But here we are, folks. For good news to be good news, it must sound like good news. But you see, it can only be good news if you've seen the child, if you've seen the baby. Because when these shepherds then went to that spot and found that baby, it said, when they saw the child, they went everywhere telling everybody. Unless you get a glimpse of Jesus, you won't have any good news to share. You'll only have good news on earth. Given time, it will collapse. But heaven's news is eternal, and it's great news. Because what it means is, when a person receives Jesus Christ, first, they don't deserve it. They receive the love of God. They receive the forgiveness of God. And in eternity, there is hope. How many pop stars do you see? And when they die, oh, they'll be singing in heaven. Sebi Ballesteros dies of cancer, the great Spanish golfer. He's probably playing on the 18th green in heaven now. Well, you know, we wish him well and we hope he got saved. But here's the point. It's sentimental claptrap, isn't it, most of it? Say something nice on the day. You don't set people. But if you want certainty, this day you will be with me in paradise. That's good news for a dying man, isn't it? This day you will be with me. Not you may be, or, well, think about it. You shall be with me in paradise. And ladies and gentlemen, in this room, you will experience walking walk the streets of Liverpool, and some of you, most of you, I'm sure, walking the, the streets of heaven. Isn't that good? 
What would you do if you end up in a house next door to somebody you didn't get on with? Don't know if they do rentals and can you shift, it'll have to be worked out up there. But here's the point, folks, you'll be there, won't you? Isn't that good? Now that is good news. And then it says here about these shepherds and the announcement of there is born to you this day in the city of David a saviour. Now heaven called Jesus a saviour. Jesus does give us peace. He does give us hope. He makes us happy. But when heaven speaks about the child to earth, he says, look at him as a saviour. You see, if you only view life from earth's standpoint, you probably miss him being a saviour. But when you see what heaven sees and sees the lost estate of men and sees what happens after the grave, the great divide, depart from me, I have never known thee. That's an awful day, isn't it? For them? It's from that we need a saviour. And when you share the gospel, ladies and gentlemen, we do have to nearly get people lost. We have to tell them, you're in a dire strait here, you are in a mess. So you go downtown and say, somebody, um, you need to get home really quickly because there's a fire in your house. Oh, well, don't worry, it's only a pilot light, it's just been left on. You're not going to get too worried about getting home now to put the fire out, are you? Well, there you are in the Royal, and they wake you up after your operation, and your major operation, and then the doctor says, we've examined you, Mrs. Jones. Now, listen, you've got an gro ingrowing toenail. It's really serious. You're not going to get too worried about an ingrowing toenail, are you? Why does heaven call him a saviour? Because heaven knows what happens next. And we should remember, we view this event, we view life, we view eternity from heaven's standpoint. Men will be sent away forever. The madhouse of the universe is wide open for millions. And we've been saved from that by the saviour. Isn't that good? And then when you move over now quickly to Matthew's Gospel, we'll just draw out some lessons there. Now Matthew, as you well know, writes about the kingship of Jesus. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king. Now, there was two Herods. There was a Herod when Jesus was born, and there was a Herod at the death of Jesus. There'd been a switchover. And this is Herod, and it says, where is he born king of the Jews? I don't, I can't quite remember how old Prince Charles was when he was crowned. What, 75, 76? But they didn't say of Charles 76 years ago, here's Charles born the king of England, did they? He wasn't born a king. He was waiting in the wings but here's a baby born king of the Jews. He only had to show up to be king. And they said, where is he born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and have come to worship him. Now, these men who were wise, I suppose you could probably sit down and think, well, academically, you know, would they get about 50 A-levels or something? Or would they end up at Oxford or Cambridge or somewhere? But I think it's more a case they were men of st studying the stars. And they knew that when that star appeared and the Messiah would be born. And that star did appear and then they said, right, if he's going to be king of the Jews, what's the most logical city to go to? You know, a king is, a king is born or a child is born to royalty in London because that's where the palace is, yeah? So we go to London, and it's in the UK. Now, my point I'm making is this. They probably just thought, this is a Jewish delivery. The Messiah would come out of Judaism, so let's go to Jerusalem. 
But for them, that was a massive journey as well. But it says, we have come to worship him. So their heart was to worship this child. And you find in society, lots of people worship. Try and just find my little story here. A few years ago in the Liverpool Echo, there was a headline, Meet the die-hard Liverpoolian fan, Liverpool fan, taking the longest possible trip of 24,000 miles to watch his team. So the lad lived in Frodsham, but he was doing some studies in Brisbane, Australia, and his mum lived in Frodsham. His mum was called Alison. They bought him a £1,950 ticket to see Liverpool play Real Madrid in the European Cup final or the Champions League final. Sorry if you're a red, you got beat 3-1. Okay? This is what he, his mum said. My son has always been obsessed with Liverpool Football Club since a child. He started his journey nine days before the game kicked off. He went through five countries, three flights, a train, and a 14-hour coach journey. His name was Matthew Sinano. He was 21, and it happened on the 26th of May, the match, 19, sorry, 2018. I'll tell you what, when you look at Matthew's dedication to that match, there's one thing you can't say. He didn't love Liverpool, did he? You can't say that. Because it gave away how he loved what he was going for. Ladies and gentlemen, them men loved the Messiah. They travelled the world. Effort was put in. Herod was to say to them, you go and find him, and when you've found him, come and tell me. In other words, no effort from me. And he said, and I will worship him. Well, he wasn't going to worship him at all. He was going to try and wipe him out. In other words, what I'm saying to you is this. When you love Jesus, you'll put the spade work in. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you get into God's word? Do I? Do you know God's word? Do you read it? Or is it weeks since you sat down with a cup of tea and pencil and started to make some notes for yourself in your own quiet room? Because the blessed life does not walk in the counsel of the thinking of the world, but his delight by day and night is the law of God Almighty. And these men, when they set off and arrived, we have come to worship him. Isn't that good? Now the next thing you'll see is they brought their gifts, which we all know what they are. But as you will also know, another prophecy would say that this child had to flee into Egypt. And what was the currency of Egypt? Gold. So they came all the way across the world with gold because God was providing for a family and his son. Isn't that good? And when you trust Jesus Christ and ask him to take over the control of your life, do you know what's happening? A divine, if you like, watch comes on your life. He'll look after you. He said, tell me your needs and your heavenly father, Matthew 6, 6, read it for yourself, who knows what you need before you ask. It's there. And so, ladies and gentlemen, what I'm saying to you is this. The lesson here is that God provided for his child and God will provide for you. Trust him. That pleases him. And then notice, just as we close, that um, when they went to the palace and they found Herod, verse 2, chapter 2 of Matthew, where is he being born king of the Jews? We have seen his star in the east and have come to worship it. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled. Now, why would a helpless baby trouble a king? Well, of course, Herod wanted to be king. 
and he is a rival king. And isn't it true, folks, if you want to stop everybody and quieten the room in a pub or in your living room, just mention Jesus Christ, and the place goes into shock. And it's the world of the devil's world, the non-Christian world, they're rattled. And they get upset if you mention the gospel, don't they? And ladies and gentlemen, that is because the world is troubled by Jesus Christ. And Herod the king was troubled because a rival king was on the planet. But notice the answer to the wise men's problem. They said, where is he born king of the Jews? We've seen his star in the east. We've come to worship him. Herod is troubled. And then it says, in verse 4, and when he had gathered all the priests and the scribes of the people together, he inquired of them where the Christ would be born. So they actually had the answer in their hands because it was all written in the Old Testament. And the Jews would be, you know, owners of that, the oracles of God. But they didn't take any notice. They weren't bothered. Apathy reigned. So what? And that's because they thought they'd be here forever. Now, ladies and gentlemen, there may be people in this room, you've been coming to Bethel for a long time. Good, keep coming. But you've never really opened your heart to Jesus. The answer is here. But you've never really said yes to Jesus. When my mum was 94, I had cause to say to her, Mummy, have you ever really asked Jesus to forgive you? And in an Irish voice, she said, No, I have not. Would you like to? I would. And we sat down, and that night, two years before she died, my mummy asked Jesus to be a saviour. Have you? It's good to come, it's good to sing, it's good to have your mates here, it's good to have all the benefits of church, these people will look after you. But have you ever actually opened your heart and said, God, I would like you to forgive me and cleanse me and be my saviour. I would like you to give me this new life. Do you know how you get it? Because when you go searching for it, you end up saying this, well, it doesn't seem to work. I keep saying my prayer, but it doesn't seem to work. Do you know why people get there? Because when they say the prayer, they don't believe they're in. They've got to start believing they're in when they're in. So yesterday I was in Blackpool doing street work, and a man stopped, nice blue jacket, about 40 years of age, not his jacket, the man. And um, I said, what's your name? He said, Paul. I said, what do you think, Paul? And we had a talk for an hour the streets of Blackpool. And I turned to him with the Gospel of John. I said, Paul, look, take this book. And I said, um, before you read it, just ask God to speak to you. And just pray, if you're there, will you speak to me? Do you know what he said? He said, Vinny, I don't have to ask him if he's there. He is there. I just want to find him. I want it to work. I said, well, what you need is believe you're in when you're in. And folks, that's when it works, when you say, I'm in. Because I've repented, and by faith I've come to Jesus, I'm in. All the Father gives me will come to me, the one who comes to me, I shall never turn away. John 6, 37, he will never turn you away. So they then now go to Bethlehem in Judea, and of course what happens is they find the child, they worship him, and then what happens is this. He sends them to Bethlehem. They go and search diligently for the young child. When you've found him, bring him back word to me that I may worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed and the star went before them. They'd seen in the east and they were very glad and it stood over where the young child was. Verse 9. And look at verse 11. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, fell down and worshipped him. And when they'd opened their treasures, they presented to him gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. 
and being divinely warned in a dream they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. And you know what happened next? Herod got word he'd been tricked. This wicked man. And he worked out when the child was born and he said, right, any baby boy under the age of two, slaughtered. When a non-Christian thinks they're okay, they bear the same nature as King Herod. When God says we're sinners, we've got the same nature and given the circumstance, we can do the most horrendous crime, given the circumstance. And so we've got to come to this child who went to a cross and say, God, forgive me. I never knew I had to look at it from heaven's point of view and conclude, as heaven does, that all men are sinners and beyond the grave there's a judgment. But when you come to Christ and he says, come, I'll forgive you, I'll cleanse you, I'll wash you. Do you know what? Your nature changes. And people who are wicked become kind. And people who are in prison become favourable and helpful. And people who used to rob become givers. And people who are drug pushers have a heart for other people. And do you know what it means is society all books up. The place gets good. But men left to their raw natural self, give them time, and it can be horrendous. Never forget, Adolf Hitler was once a choir boy. And so there's a few lessons from the birth of Jesus. But I just want to close by saying this. Ladies and gentlemen, God does not speak to you and promise you to ever speak to you again. He doesn't. While you hear his voice, while the door on the ark is open, get on board. There's no promise that he'll speak to you ever again. I have a person in my family, and um, she's got a illness, so it will take a life. And when she was younger, she helped me become a Christian. When we heard that she was very ill, I wrote to her. Now I thought this letter would get through. And here's a prayer that Dad prayed to help you to be in the kingdom because she'd fallen away for many years. And I put in there an envelope with my address on and a stamp on. And I said, when you make this your prayer, just send the envelope back. Nothing in the envelope, but when you make it your prayer, send the envelope back. Because I wanted to know she'd be saved. So the day came about a week later, the envelope reply came back. I ran downstairs, picked it up. Never speak to me about this again. Do you think God will speak to you every day? Kind of him to speak tonight. While you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. We'll stand and sing a lovely hymn. Art the herald angels sing.